Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. Our theme this year is making disciples. And with that theme guiding us, directing us, we open the Bible and we read Matthew chapter 5. One day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and he sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. Well, when we read that, we just can't think of one other thing to begin our year studying verse by verse than Jesus gathering his disciples around them and begin to teach them. With our theme being making disciples, uh, this is the, the best place for us to start. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is the longest discourse, continual discourse of Jesus that we have in record in the gospel. And that's what makes this such a significant passage in Scripture. Because when Jesus sits down and begins to teach, it's not just a sentence here or a thought here. We're talking about Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's the longest single discourse that Jesus gives us. It's a, a very practical teaching, not, not a lot of what we would consider doctrine of faith. It's, it's not much about what we believe, but it's full of what we're supposed to do. He is literally teaching his disciples. And Jesus' input is in doing. Here's what you do. If you do these things, and if you will live like this, I believe in doing the things that he teaches us, then you just become aware of whether this is of God or whether it's not of God. You, you become aware of more doctrinal issues when you understand the lifestyle that Jesus wants us to live. The Sermon on the Mountain it is not to fill our heads with just religious ideas, but it's to guide our daily lives as we learn to be and to make disciples. And that's what our theme is all about this year. That's what we are doing. We are learning to be disciples. We're learning to make disciples because that is an answer to the Great Commission. And as we do that, blessed will you be. Blessed will you be. The first point that I want to open with is you can't read this without being fully convinced that God wants you blessed. God wants you blessed. And, and a lot of people, for a lot of reasons in their life, believe God is against them. We've got certain denominations or groups of people that say that God is against you or God is after you or God's out to get you or God's out to punish you. God wants to bless you. Now, you may not be living a life that is blessable, but let me just tell you, God wants to bless you. Nine verses in a row starts out with God blesses those who. God blesses those who. You, you've got to glean from this. God's desire, God's heart is to bless you. The Sermon on the Mountain is a, a descriptive picture of true discipleship. What does a disciple look like? When you're asking yourself, okay, paint me a picture, paint me a portrait, what does a disciple look like? Here's the picture. And there's just absolutely nothing better for us to study as we are making our theme, becoming disciples, making disciples, than the Sermon on the Mount. Let's get started. In this first lesson, I want to look at verse 1 through verse 12. One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up to the mountainside and he sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, 
for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you, persecute you, lie about you, and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. There's a lot here. Verse 1 opens up. He went up on a mountain. Now, that is very, very important. And it is very significant when we read, he went up on a mountain. He went up on the mountainside. What is very significant about that is, is the fact that it was a common mountain. What's very significant, it's a very common mountain. And, and, and we can turn to countless places in Scripture. John 4, 20, the woman at the well. Remember she said, oh, you guys think this mountain is the one we ought to worship on. But, you know, we Samaritans believe this mountain. There was a lot of controversy on special mountains and which mountain was holy, which mountain was not holy. You read about Mount Ger- Gerizim. You read about Mount Ebal, a place where Abraham built an altar. There were blessings and curses that came from God. God uh, took Moses up on a mountain and and, and gave him the uh, Ten Commandments. So several, throughout Scripture, we read about several very holy mountains. One being the most holy, where Moses went up to receive the Ten Commandments. Now, what's very significant about that is you study the, the, the Scripture. You remember Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God, but nobody was allowed to go up there. Does everybody remember that? I mean, you were not allowed to go up there. I mean, you'd be struck down. You didn't go up on the holy mountain. Only Moses went up there. Only people of spiritual importance were able to go up. On... What did we just read here in verse 1? What did we just read here? Common mountain. Everybody goes up there. Wait a minute. We're seeing something vitally significant right here as Jesus is introducing the new covenant. Something, wow. I mean, their mouths were just dropping open. Here we are going up on the mountain with Jesus. Not a significant holy mountain. Look here, there's no holy place that you have to be. You can worship God right where you are. You worship God in your truck on the way to work. You worship God pushing a lawnmower. You worship God out weed eating. You worship God out roofing a house. You, there's not a holy mountain where we believe God is. Well, we believe God is on this mountain. We, look here. All of that is over with as Jesus is ushering in the new covenant. So it's vital that you see this. Vital that you see not a holy, just a common mountain. It's vital that you see everybody followed him up there. Oh, y'all stay down. You can't go up on this mountain. No, everybody was welcome to go up here. Very important. Jesus is ushering in the new covenant here, and you can't read over that. Always know as we read Jesus, there's always two groups of followers. There's the disciples that followed him for the love of learning. He gathered his disciples around him and he began to teach them. There's always the disciples who have a love for learning. And then there's always the multitudes that follow him for the healings, the miracles, the cures, the the supernatural events, the the feeding of the fish and the chips and the breaking of the loaves. And And it's still today. It's still today. If, if you have a Wednesday night Bible study, you got a small crowd that comes. If you go and rent the convention center and you start talking about healing services, you can have them come for hours before you start. Tens of thousands will pack into big coliseums and they'll stand out in the street if we're all getting healed and everybody's having this, this miraculous supernatural. But if you want to teach the Word, you just get a handful of people. Same today. There are those that want to follow God for what He does what he can do for me, the miracles he can work for me, and there's those that want to follow God because what they can learn from him. I want to make a lifestyle change. I want you to teach me how to live my life. I want to follow you because what you teach me about my life. Healing services to pack out the Colosseum. Teaching service be a few. And here Jesus says, look here, you guys gather around here and let me teach you something. That's where we are. Over the years, I've spent a lot of hours looking up the definitions 
of original words because sometimes they can make the scripture really open your eyes to some things that you might otherwise miss. We read that word blessed are you, God blesses, God blesses, blessed are you, blessed are you. When you read that over and over and over, that comes from a word makarios, M-A-K-A-R-I-O-S. And listen to what this means. A spiritual joy and a satisfaction that lasts regardless of the conditions of life. That's a wow. That is a wow. When he says blessed are you, it's just not $10 in your pocket. Blessed are you, what does that word mean? What does he say? What kind of lifestyle will you live? You will live in a spiritual joy and a satisfaction that lasts regardless of the conditions of life. Conditions of life come and go and they're up and down and they're in and out. God has a life for you of joy and satisfaction that just lasts regardless of what your day holds. The word happy or to be blessed is what mankind seeks. The problem is they seek it on this earth. We seek it in position, we seek it in money, we seek it in fame, we seek it in pleasures, and it just doesn't work. Go to the back of your Bible, 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Don't love this world or the things it offers, for when you love the world, you don't have the love of the Father in you, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and a pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. When man seeks to be blessed only in this world, you look and see what that offers. But whenever you get your heart right with God, you live in a place of true happiness, a true joy, and a true satisfaction. Let's get started. Jesus gives us eight characteristics of blessed people. If you're taking notes, we want to write down eight characteristics of blessed people. We all want to be blessed. There's not anybody in here that doesn't want to be blessed. Nobody wants to be cursed. We want to be blessed. We want to be blessed in our life, in our homes, in our family, in our job, in our career. We want to be blessed. We want to live a blessed life. All right, here is the way you pull this off. Here's eight characteristics of blessed people. Number one is found in verse two and three, poor in spirit. Some translations say the same thing when it says, realize their need for him. Poor in spirit. Realizing your need for God does not mean that you're poverty stricken in your checkbook. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about you don't have a dime, you, you're hungry and you're naked, you don't even have a place to live and you're sleeping in a cardboard box. Jesus is not talking about material poverty here. He's talking about an acknowledgement of helplessness in and of yourself before God, a spiritual poverty in your own strength, and a desire, a need to depend on God. See, you're you're not poor in your checkbook. Look, I can't make it on my own. I need you, Lord. God, I need... See, and in this day and time of self-sufficiency and pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps and make my own way, I can do it my own way, I can do my own way... We come to a place in life where, God, I need you. And you know you do. You know you do. You have come to the end of yourself. And for many people, how long will it take before you come to the need of your self-sufficiency? What will it take for you to lay there and say, God, I need you? Don't wait till the doctor's given you a few minutes to live before you say, God, I can't do life without you. I need you. Poor in spirit. Not me. It doesn't mean you're broken your checkbook. I need you, Lord. I recognize and I realize my need for you. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. 
The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Verse 4. God blesses those who mourn. That word in the Greek <clears throat> means, and it's, this, it's, it's, it's this, that word is the strongest word offered for deep, desperate sorrow. That word means deep and desperate sorrow. You come to a place where you have a deep and desperate sorrow about your sin. You're not bragging about it. You're not laughing about it. You're not joking about it. You're not looking forward to it. You truly are sorry for the life you've lived. You are broken hearted over evil. You, 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 you hate Sin, you hate what it does, you hate what it represents, you hate the way it destroys people, you hate the way it's destroyed you, and you are truly sorry for your sin. Luke chapter 18, just a couple of scriptures we'll turn to. Luke chapter 18, verse 10. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, I'm not like that sinner. For I don't cheat, I don't sin, I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. Verse 13. But the tax collector stood at a distance, dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh, God. Be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. When he talks about God blesses those who mourn, he's talking about those who are truly mourning over sin, over evil, and over wickedness. I hate it. I hate what it does. And God, I am sorry for what I've done. You're not going around bragging about what you've done. You're not bragging and being boastful and arrogant about the life you've lived. And the, Look, God, I am broken over my sin. Number three, verse five. Some translations say humble. Some say gentle. Some say meek. Uh, these are three different translations of the very same word. Meek means, and, and listen to this very carefully, strong but tender, strong but teachable, not spineless, able to control himself, a disciplined person. God blesses those who are strong but still tender, strong but still teachable. They're not spineless. They're able to control themselves. They're a disciplined person. We just got too many today that live with an air of sufficiency. A meek person knows he needs God. Romans 12, 3 reminds us, that don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Just don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Number four, verse 6. God blesses those who hunger and thirst. Who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Or the word justice before God. Justice before God is being right with God. Righteousness, those are the same words. It's very interesting in the original text, hunger and thirst are one word. We've separated those out in English because we talk about hunger and thirst. But, but in the original, that's one word that means a starving. A starving. It is a parched and dying condition that is craving. You are craving hunger and thirst. Yeah, I'm a little hungry. No, I'm talking about a craving, a starving, a, a parched existence that is craving righteousness. That is craving being right with God, being just before God. Who's blessed? One who is craving right standing with God. Who's blessed? 
What? See, we're not saying that we're perfect. I'm not perfect. I mess up, but I want perfect. See, I'm not perfect. I mess up, but I want to do right before God. I want at the end of the day for God to be pleased with me. That's what I want. I, I desire that. that. That is my hunger and my thirst. My passion is that God is happy with me. Now, he's not always happy with me, but that's what I want. See, I'm hungering and thirsting. I'm craving that. Some have craved alcohol. Some have craved drugs. Some have craved money. Some have craved cars or prestige. Some have craved popularity. It's a position in life, I'll die without it. I have to be right with God. That person is blessed. Not somebody who's always perfect, never makes a mistake, but somebody who sure is trying. I want to be right before you. Number five, verse seven. The word merciful. God blesses those who are merciful. That word means to have a forgiving spirit. You forgive those who wronged you. Merciful. You show mercy. You forgive wrongdoing. It, you know, one of the things that I, I wish wasn't in the Bible, but it is. God forgives me on the same measure that I forgive other people. And there's some people that don't need forgiving in my eyes. You know, they did wrong, and I need to hold them in contempt. Now, I'm justified in that. Except the Bible just doesn't agree with me. And, and the measure of forgiveness that I receive depends on the measure of forgiveness that I give. And God blesses those who are merciful. I got to forgive, and I got to let it go, and I got to go on. God blesses those who don't hold a grudge who don't live bitter, who don't live resentful, who don't live trying to get even, God blesses those who are merciful. Number six, verse eight. Pure in heart. God blesses those whose hearts are pure. That word pure means unmixed, unpolluted, clean, in the horse business or in the cattle business or those that raise dogs. When you say, I raise purebred quarter horses, that means they don't have a little thoroughbred and a little Arabian and a little Welch pony. I mean, that they're every, every, you go back as far as you can go, and everybody on the mom's side, everybody on the dad's side, everybody on the granddad's side was a purebred. See, it's pure. It's unmixed. It's unpolluted. It's a purebred. God blesses those who are unmixed in their heart who are unpolluted in their heart, who are clean and right before God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. I will be your father. You will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Psalms 24. Psalms 24, verse 3. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Those with hands and hearts that are pure. Those who don't worship idols, don't tell lies. Those whose hands and hearts are pure. Pure in heart. Those that are pure in heart shall see God. Verse 8. God blesses those whose hearts are pure are pure. You just don't live double-minded. You, you don't live a little in the world on Friday night, and then you come to church on Sunday, and you do the spiritual deal, and hello, brother, and God bless you, sister, and God bless you, and then you go out, and you live like hell on Monday and Tuesday, and then you come to church Wednesday, and God bless you. God, God blesses those who are pure in heart. That means you're the same on Sunday morning as you are on Saturday night. You're the same wherever you are. Not with this group of friends you act like this and this group of friends you act like that. With this group of friends I use this vocabulary and these words, but I would never use those words around this group of friends over here. God blesses those who are unmixed, who are unpolluted, who are pure in heart. Number 8, verse 10, 11, and 12 
The word persecuted means to endure suffering. Ridiculed, criticized, ostracized, to be treated with hostility. Pressures just don't get us. I like verse 12. The reward in heaven is great. You just, you don't have to worry about it. God wants you blessed. God wants you blessed. I want to make sure you get that. God wants to bless you. That's his plan. That's his purpose. God's desire. He's not against you. God's not out to get you. God's desire is that you live a blessed life. He desires that so much that he sent Jesus so that you could be blessed. He sent Jesus who taught us the way to be blessed. And here are the steps in life to blessings. Too often, it's preached against that God even wants you blessed. We're not a money-hungry gospel. We're just a gospel that believes God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. And here are eight characteristics that Jesus gives us of blessed people. You want to be blessed? You want your home, your life, your business? You want to live blessed? Well, all of us do. Let me just let you in on something. Number one... He blesses those who are poor in spirit. They live seeing their need for God. Here's another characteristic. God blesses those who mourn over sin. God blesses those who are sorrowful over their sin. They mourn over their sin. Number three. God blesses those who are gentle and who are meek. Don't don't live with a self-sufficient attitude. God, I need you. God, I can do it myself. I don't need God. I don't need anything God's got to offer. I made this money. I made this living. I'm a... Be careful. Don't, don't, don't say that. Deuteronomy warns us, when you get in this land and God starts blessing you, be very careful about saying, it's my might and my power that has gotten me this wealth. Because without God giving you might and giving you power, you ain't got jack. And you need to know that. You live knowing that. I, you, you live what he calls gentle or meek. That simply means it's not a self-sufficient attitude. God, I need you. I need you. The fourth characteristic is, is you've got a craving. You, you've got a craving for righteousness. I want to live just I want to live right before you. God, forgive me when I mess up. I hate it when I mess up. I'm so mad at myself when I mess up. But God, I want you to know I want to live right. There's a time in your life when you wanted to mess up. You planned for it. You got on the phone and planned for where you were going to meet to mess up. You organized messing up. You coordinated your efforts to mess up. I may mess up. But I sure don't want to. God, I'm craving doing right before you. Number five, a merciful person is one who, who's not a grudge holder. You're not a grudge holder. The fact is people do you wrong every day. People say things and hurt feelings and, and gossip about you. Things happen every day. And, and we live with imperfect people in an imperfect world. But you're merciful Because you happen to need so much mercy. I would love to be to the place where I could be unmerciful because I don't need any mercy. But still in this place I'm in life, I still need a lot of forgiveness. I need a lot of forgiveness. I need people around me that will overlook my imperfections. You know, I need my wife to roll her eyes and say, bless his heart. So what does that require of me? When I need coworkers that will roll their eyes and pat me on the back and everything's going to be okay, and they overlook my imperfections, 
I need co-workers that will overlook my imperfections. So what does that require of me? Are you understanding this? See, you and I all need people to forgive us and to be merciful toward us and not give us what we need. Because you often need a punch right in the nose is what you need. I need people around me who are merciful. So what does that mean? I got to be merciful. And God blesses those people who do that. Number six, pure in heart. I I, I don't want to act this way around these friends and this way around these friends. I I don't want to use this vocabulary around these friends and this vocabulary around these friends. I, I, I don't want to ever be in a position in life where if I get a text, I can't let my wife read the text to me. Here, my phone just went off. See who it is and what they want. I don't ever want to live that I got to grab my phone before I dare let her see what somebody else typed me or said to me. You know, I I want to be pure in my heart. Where my life on Sunday morning is the same as my life on Saturday night. God, I want to live a pure in heart life before you. Number seven. Peacemakers, that's verse, verse 9, one who strives to make peace. One who strives to make peace. Let me tell you something. This is not absent of conflict. We have conflict. We have misunderstandings. And sometimes we have to have a conflict. Sometimes my wife and I have some serious conflicts. But the purpose of that conflict is to have peace. Too many people have conflict for conflict's sake, and the conflict produces more conflict. We're not fighting just to fight so that we can be worse or mad. Why we're in this is to bring peace back in our relationship. While we're in this is to bring, and, and that's, I think that's the purpose of, of the police. That's the purpose of uh, an army and a navy. That's the purpose of war. It's not just to go around and shoot people. It's to bring peace. It is to, and so the, you, not, when it says blessed are the peacemakers, we're not telling you that you never have conflict. We're telling you that your conflict has to have the end goal of peace. That's what this is all about. We're not fighting here just to fight. We are a peacemaker. We may be in a fight right now, but the only reason we're in this is to establish and to make peace. I want to be a peacemaker. Number eight, you just endure persecution. It just doesn't get you. God wants you blessed. God wants you live blessed. God wants you being blessed. Write these eight characteristics down of blessed people. They're right here in chapter 5 of Matthew. Read these several times a day, over and over and over, because this is the recipe for the blessings in life that God has for us. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, lesson number one. It's very interesting. It's not a holy mount, but a common one, because the gospel is open for everybody. Jesus teaching his disciples, that would be all of us, on how to live blessed. Y'all stand. Well, we thank you for your word to us and your instructions on how to achieve the very thing we're longing for. Lord, you've given us clear instructions on how to possess the very thing that we're after. Now, God, direct us and guide us is our life is lived pleasing and in honor and right before you. In Jesus' name, amen.